Father, we come again to you on this Lord's Day to once again just continue to worship you. So, Father, we just pray that you bless this service. Again, be with each and every one that's here and listening online. We thank you, Lord, so much for the opportunity to be able to have the opportunity to be able to worship you. And, and Father, we know that there are many revivals going on all over the nation and in uh, Baptist churches and so forth. And, and some have already recently passed and so forth. But we pray, Lord, that those things be more than just revival in name. You know, oftentimes, you know, Baptist churches have what we call revivals, but unfortunately, they're never really just revivals. They're just big uh, get-togethers of some good preaching, but they're not really true revivals. You know, people are all supposedly worn out afterwards, and then they can't come to church for a while. And you don't see them going out there trying to, you know, there's no change in anybody's lives. They're not out there having a burden to go out there and try to win souls. And so, Father, I just pray that for these revivals that just recently happened or the ones that are going on or getting ready to come up, that uh, they will become true revivals. That, but we know, Lord, that a true revival can only happen with the King James Bible, too. And that's the problem where a lot of these churches are blinded to the fact that they don't even have God's Word in there. And they're using counterfeit Satan's counterfeit Bible. So you cannot have a revival without the true Word of God. And so we pray, Lord, that uh, a true revival will come to this nation because you know, not just in the Baptist churches, but in all the churches, because, you know, we see what's going on in the Methodist churches where the, uh, you know, the churches have been splitting over all this uh, LGBT stuff, which they rightly should, Lord, that uh, they need to get out of that if, you know, their, their leaders are standing for what goes against your word. But, Lord, we know this nation is in desperate need of a revival that, that uh, the world itself is. And that our nation is just vastly turning away from you, Lord, and, and, and as the world is, you know, we kind of, in one sense, we kind of set the pattern for the world that as we go, the whole world goes. And so, Father, we just pray that the people around the world will, you know, will realize they need to get not only their, their own hearts right, but we need to try to win souls before it's too late. We know that your return, the return of Jesus is soon. And the tribulation that we're going to be studying here in Revelation is, is going to be soon. It's around the corner. You know, people think it's a joke, but they're going to find out soon how real it is. And they're going to wish they had, had listened, not only to me, but to other good godly preachers. So, Father, we just pray that you be with those godly men that are out there preaching your word today, and the missionaries and so forth, and that many souls might be one. You put a hedge around us, keep us all healthy and safe, continue to pray for the situation over there in Israel, pray for the peace and give Israel the, the wisdom to defeat the, the evil of Hamas. And so, Father, we just pray that as I preach revelation here, that you'll give your servant the words that need to be spoken and have the hearts, minds, and ears open to hear and understand that word. And we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be continuing our study in Revelation. This will be Revelation part 37. And we started looking, well, we were looking last week at, uh, we started chapter, Revelation chapter 6, and the, um, you know, remember I said, you know, he opened up, you know, there was these uh, four beasts and so forth, and they told John to come take a look. Well, in verse 2, then Jesus opens up that first seal, and you know, immediately, and then there's this white horse appears with this man riding it. That, you know, he had this bow and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer and so forth. And I said that, you know, that, that the man on that, that white horse was the Antichrist, you know. And I said, you know, we know that white represents purity or peace, you know. Like in, a, in wartime, if you want peace, you, you wave a white flag or white handkerchief or, you know, white something, white T-shirt or something to try to, Hey, I'm, I, you know, I want peace. You know that, you know, everybody understands that white represents peace. So, you know, but that's also in one sense it represents purity, like a, you know, hence a, a bride in theory is supposed to be pure, which most of them, as I said, are not. But they're supposed to be pure when they get married. And you know, here it is. You know, he's, you know, he's he's the man. He's the, you know, he doesn't tell by the Antichrist, but you know, everybody thinks he's just such a wonder. And so, you know, he's like so pure in, in, in everybody's eyes. But he. Um, so he comes to bring this false peace. And I said that, you know, it says that he it says that he goes forth conquering. 
And we see that he's got a bow there. You know, he gives the world gives him a crown because they're going to make him basically the king of the world. He becomes the world dictator. And then he gets this bow. I mean, he has a bow, which again, you know, what do you use for bows for? Now, he doesn't have the arrows, which shows, quote, the peace, but it shows that false peace. And so we see, um, you know, those things going on. And as I said, that, that that's not going to be long before that that first that rider that first horse is going to appear and i said you know that it's going to you know there's disagreement on um you know when this rider will appear some say that you know that it represents the battle of gog and magog and so forth and i said some say that's at the midpoint of the tribulation when the antichrist desecrates the temple some say that it's in between the the rapture and the tribulation and you know that's what brings in the peace and you know, and I said, what's going on over there in Israel? You know, people say this is leading to the end. Now, I don't know that this is directly the, the end, end. You know, there, Jesus said, you know, there would be wars and rumors of wars before I return. But I do think it's setting up things that, you know, whether Israel will be involved in another war before Jesus returns or whatever. But it's one of those things that, you know, these nations are all trying to unite and so forth. And, you know, just funny that I find it interesting, as I've said it before, but, you know, all these nations seem to be, jumping on the bandwagon for Israel when normally they're always totally against them, you know, except for like the Arab nations. But they, uh, you know, I think it's, it's setting it up because, you know, the Antichrist has to be, it, when he goes to be, you know, if, he's, if he acts like he's all hates Israel, it's going to be hard to, you know, get peace with them. You know, you want to act like he's a buddy right now. So that's why they're all trying to be buddies because they're preparing for this Antichrist to come to bring that so-called peace to Israel. You know, remember when they when Israel signs that seven year treaty, that's what signifies the start of the tribulation. So, you know, if you're still here and you see that, you're going to be in for a, a long ride. But now, <clears throat> starting here with chapter six and continuing through chapter nineteen, then we will be dealing with the tribulation. Now, I mentioned that before, but the, you know, chapters four and five. You know, the beginning of the first three chapters, John gets the, the vision, you know, Jesus tells him about, you know, gets the letters to the churches in two and three. And then he just kind of tells him about himself a little bit, whatever, and shows him, you know, his glorified, you know, himself and everything, you know, him, him in his full glory. And then John is taken up to heaven representing the rapture of the church in verses four and five. And he sees things up in heaven and he sees this book with the seven seals, which now Jesus opens up this first one. And then we got chapter 6 through 19 where the church is not mentioned. And, you know, this is dealing with, with uh, you know, the tribulation. And then after that, we'll see a little bit in the millennium. And uh, then, you know, a little bit of the new heaven and new earth and so forth at the end of Revelation. But, you know, the tribulation takes up most of Revelation with 14 of the 22 chapters <coughs> you know, dealing with, with the tribulation, or, you know, so, you know, you figure there's, there's, that's a little over two thirds of revelation deals with the tribulation. You know, remember this is just a seven year period, but you know, there's, you know, you have more of the Holy Bible that deals with this seven year period in history more than any other period other than the final week of Jesus' life at his first coming just before his death on the cross. You know, there's a bunch of chapters dealing with, that final week of Jesus before he died on the cross for our sins. But other than that, then, you know, basically this seven year period, you know, I mean, look at even, you know, the creation, the week, creation week, you know, there's not that much, you know, dealing with that. And, and, um, you know, you got a couple chap, really one chapter and then a little bit in chapter two, you know, kind of re rehashes some of the stuff. So basically you got a couple chapters dealing with the creation of the entire universe. And yet, you know, you look what how much, and then and this is just a revelation. This isn't like this is the only thing that deals with tribulation. It's just in a revelation. So, but we see that, you know, how much is, you know, the significance of this. You know, it's just like Jesus spoke far more on hell than he did on heaven. It's the same thing here. He wants people to know what's coming. You know, he's trying to warn people, look, this is not a time period you want to be there. So I would suggest you get saved because you do not want to be there, especially during the second half of the tribulation, which is known as the Great Tribulation. So, 
You know, that's why there's so much significance on it. And that's why he had the warnings, too, to make sure that you read Revelation, you know, where people, they want to always throw that book out or ignore it and so forth, so or make it symbolic and stuff. So, But as I said, the church is never mentioned in these chapters and only appears after in the millennium, which again shows the true church will not go through the tribulation. So it's not until, you know, when this is all done, when... The, you know, the chapter, when, you know, we get into chapter 20 and so forth, and you start talking about the millennium again, you know, which is after, you know, that thousand year reign of Jesus after the seven year tribulation, then we see the church appear again. So, you know, it shows that, you know, the church is not going to be going to be here because, uh, you know, there's no mention of the church during this time period. Plus, you know, right now we're living in what's known as the church age or whatever, the church time period or whatever that, that, um, uh, you know, during the tribulation, it's going to go back to the time, you know, or it's the time of the Gentiles, as, you know, no one else. But during the tribulation, it's going to go back to the time of what Israel was. You know, what Israel was going up to the death of Jesus. It's, you know, Israel is going to be the focus. And, you know, I said that was basically the whole point of the, the tribulation and so forth, was to bring them to see Jesus as Messiah. And... You know, they're going to go back to, you know, build, they build another temple, a tribulation temple, you know, a third temple. They, they uh, go back to animal sacrifices and they do all these things. You know, we know that there has to be a temple because the, the Antichrist is going to desecrate it in the midpoint. Well, you cannot desecrate it if, you know, something that, that's, you know, unless it's there. Well, it's not there now. So we know it's going to have to happen soon that, you know, we know that the things are getting in place. That they already have all the things that need to go in there. They've already got the priest trained and and so forth. So, you know, they're ready to do it. They're just waiting for the, the word go. And I don't think it's going to take long for them to build it and, and so forth. So, <clears throat> but the point is that, you know, they're going back to what that was, you know, where, where if the church was there, you know, this is the age of grace right now. There's no, there's no grace during this time period. Now the Holy Ghost itself, you know, right now he lives within us. We know from first Thessalonians that the Holy Ghost is removed. You know, it says that, you know, you know, obviously being God, he's still there. But it's just like in Old Testament. He only was in people temporarily or whatever. You know, it wasn't like, you know, he would be in everybody, you know, like when he gets saved like they are now. So that, uh, you know, it, it, when the Holy Ghost kind of gets out of the way, so to speak, you know, the restrainer, as it says in First Thessalonians, then that's when the, the Antichrist gets revealed. Well, again, if the church is all still here, we're, God lives within us. The Holy Ghost lives within us. If we're all still here, then... You know, we can't, you know, the, re the restrainer can't leave if, we, if we're still all within us. You know, I mean, we're the ones restraining Satan right now, the, the, you know, through the Holy Ghost living within us. So, again, I think it's just another example showing that the church will not be here. But now the opening of this first seal by Jesus releases the Antichrist on the world. Now, this all takes place probably only a short time after the rapture but just a small gap of time between them. You know, as I said, Scripture never really says directly, but I just don't believe that there's going to be a huge time period in between the rapture and, you know, the start of the tribulation. Because I think that's one of the things that's going to help bring in the tribulation because you're going to have all this chaos from the rapture. You know, planes that have crashed, you know, cars crash. I mean, people who drive down the road, you're saved, all of a sudden, pfft, you're gone. Cars are going to crash, planes, whatever you know, ships collide and whatever and so forth like that. So they, uh, you know, you're going to have chaos all over the world. And that's one of the things, and then, like I said, maybe there's still this fighting going, you know, at this point there'll be some kind of fighting. Maybe, I'm not saying it's this war here, but another war that Israel gets involved in or something like that, or, you know, the threat of somebody's threatening to attack Israel. And then that's when the Santa Christ comes in there and it's like, hey, look, you know, I, I got the solution, you know, we, I mean, I've said that before to people said during the, the pandemic there in 2020, then including the Pope himself said, which I believe, you know, not saying him because he's too old, but one of the Popes in the future will be the Antichrist. And, <clears throat> you know, he was saying we need to have a one, a one world leader temporarily to get us through this crisis. Now, of course, they're the ones that implemented this crisis and so forth, but they, um, you know, and the Pope was a, didn't say directly him, but, you know, that's what he was implying. Now, I think that's what's going to happen is, is the, you know, whoever the Antichrist is, you know, then he's going to be the same way. He'll be, he'll be like, uh, 
well, uh, I'll, um, I have the solution. You know, what we need is we need a one world leader. And then, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that. And it'd be kind of like with Joseph when he made the recommendation to the Pharaoh that you need to do this because you're going to have seven years of famine. So start storing your food for the seven years of plenty, do this, do that, distribute the food. You know, he has this whole plan. And that's when the Pharaoh says, well, I'm just going to make you in charge. Why don't you just do it? And then I think it'll be the same way. The inner Christ, he's not going to come out there and say, hey, make me the leader. But he's going to try to be the smooth talker that he is, and he'll say all this stuff. And then everybody's going to say, well, you're so, you've got a brilliant mind. Why would you just be our leader? That's, you're the kind of man we need, you know. And, well, I, I, I hope we try to be humble. No, I, I, I'm not worthy enough to do that kind of stuff. I mean, really, I think, you know, I, I don't know who, but I just I just don't think that I should be the one. No, no, really, you need to do it. And then eventually, you know, and then he'll go, yeah, all right, I'll do it. And then... You know, he'll tell Israel, look, I got a peace plan for you and so forth. And I think at that point, and that's what will help trigger it. So, you know, I just don't think, like I said, there's going to be this big, long time period in between that, uh, you know, in theory, it could be years and years. But I just don't see that because, you know, that's one of the things Satan's going to use is that, you know, UFOs and all that stuff. Look, you know, we got rid of all the people that were trying to keep this one world uh, from uniting and trying to bring peace to the world and all that. So, you know, he, that's just an excuse to try to get rid of the Christians, explain them away. You know, they were the bad people and so forth. So, but I just, like I said, I don't see a huge amount of time, but there definitely has to be a little bit of time. I mean, it's not like, you know, the rapture happens moment right now. And then later on this afternoon or tomorrow, you know, the Antichrist is signing the peace treaty because you got to allow him to get into place. And like I said, try to, figure out some things and so forth like that. So, you know, be kind of like in those left behind books that, you know, I don't agree with everything in those things, but the, um, but I mean, like one of the things is, you know, they had all, you know, the, the rapture and the pilots disappear and planes crash and so forth. And then, you know, it, it was like that. You had the, the Romanian president, uh, Carpathia, that he goes and, and, you know, then he has a couple of solutions. And then next thing you know, you know, it was like a few days later, then, you know, they're like, oh, we'll make you in charge of the UN. And then shortly after that, then they make him, a, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, things kind of go pretty fast. You know, I don't think it's going to be slow, but it's not literally going to be like the next day. You know? but, so anyway, so like I said, so you're going to have that little gap in between. Now, it is Jesus himself who brings the start of the tribulation, just as he will end it at his second coming. You know, angels, I said this before, but angels will release the rest of the 14 judgments. But these first seven seal judgments, Jesus himself unleashes. You know, he's the one that actually starts the tribulation. You know, he's in full control. He knows what's going on. He allows it. You know, many allows the angels to assist them later on. But, you know, initially, you know, for these first seven, you know, he, he's the one that releases him. And then just like he'll end it himself also. You know, he starts it, but he also ends it. You know, while well, I said, we know that the Antichrist starts in a sense when he signs that peace treaty with Israel. But it's that that's happening by Jesus opening that seal. You know, that's when that's when that's gonna happen. You know, the, this is gonna happen after the rapture. And then there's that gap or whatever. And then when the time's right, Jesus opens that seal. And at that time, that's when the Antichrist is gonna sign that seven year treaty. And that'll be that false peace and so forth. So uh, but you know I, I think it's interesting that Jesus is physically involved in the beginning. And then, of course, at the end, and then, but then in between that, then he lets the angels do the other 14 judgments. As I said, the tribulation starts when the Antichrist signs a seven-year peace treaty with Israel, which we will see he will break at the midpoint. Now, obviously, it's, it's false. You know, and, I, and I said, notice that Israel falls for this when it is only a seven-year treaty and not, in theory, a perpetual treaty. You know, I, I've said that before, and I still it just kind of amazes me. You know, just thinking of like what's going on now and you think of how Israel is so desperate for peace that, you know, even now they, they still have been holding off and going into Gaza and so forth. And I don't know if they will or what they'll end up doing. I, you know, I can't, you know, not some kind of predicting of the future, but, you know, hopefully they'll still go on there and they'll wipe out mocks. But, you know, they're so worried about uh, international opinion all the time and they need to worry about what God says and then it's their own land and so forth. And, you know, that, but they're so desperate to always try to get this peace. And, it, you know, they're willing, I mean, when you sign a peace treaty, then it's always, you know, in theory, like, okay, we're going to be buddies forever, or at least we're not going to hate each other, we'll leave each other alone, like you do your thing, we'll do our thing, but you leave me alone, I leave you alone type thing. You know, that's the whole point of a treaty. You know, no one ever says, okay, we're going to have a treaty, it's only going to be good for seven years. 
Then after seven years, I don't know, we'll see how things are going. If I didn't want to renew it or, hey, maybe I'll tack you or whatever. So, you know, like, what are they thinking? Obviously, you know, it just shows that that desperateness or whatever. But um, I just find that interesting that you would even sign a treaty knowing that it's only good for seven years. But as I said, to give up everything for a supposed only seven years of peace instead of turning to God and Jesus for true peace. You know, they should be using like this opportunity now to turn to God, realize that Jesus is that peace and so forth, and not, not um, you know, the Antichrist. But, you know, they're, they're blinded and they turn to him rather than God. Now, Daniel speaks of this treaty in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, as we will soon see. And we'll look at that probably next week, but we'll see. But as I said, there is disagreement among theologians as to how much time the seven seals cover of the tribulation. Some say one quarter, while others one half, and some even longer. You know, it depends on the, on the um, the person. Some say, as I said, that, you know, that some of this stuff takes place at the second half, you know, at the start of the second half of the tribulation. You know, so some will say that, you know, this these seals, they go for a long time. You know, they're stretched out. And I do believe that there is a much more longer time period for the seven seals versus the other 14 judgments. But, you know, to say how long exactly or whatever, but, you know, so like I said, so some say, you know, it takes, you know, just a quarter of those seven years. Some say it takes over half of that, you know, over that three and a half year period. So, you know, so, you know, there's definitely different differences of opinion on, you know, how long of a time period they take up. You know, nowhere in scripture, I mean, there are a few of them that'll say, you know, this is for, uh, like, when they when the locusts get released, those were for, if I remember, it was like six months or something. Or I can't remember exactly. It tells you how long it was, you know. So we know certain things on how long they were. But other things, we don't know, you know, how long everything was. But but as I, it is, as I said, it is true that most likely the trumpet and vile judgments, which will be the ones that follow the seal judgment will occur one after the other in a much rapid pace than the seven seal judgments and most likely be in the second half known as the Great Tribulation. You know, some theologians believe the trumpet judgments will be the second half of the first half of the tribulation. So, you know, depending on who you talk to, some say that those trumpet judgments start at the second half of the first half of the tribulation. You know, remember the tribulation is divided into two halves. Each one three and a half years. The second half, of, or the last three and a half years, is known as the Great Tribulation. And there's some that say that the trumpet and the, and the seal judgment, I mean the trumpet and the vile judgments, all take place completely in the second half during that Great Tribulation period. Or some say that no, the trumpet judgments start in the, the second half, or you know, what is it, a year and three and a half divided by two, whatever, you know, so you got year and three quarters or whatever. Uh, you know, that second half of the year and three quarters, they say that that's when those occur. Now, you know, I don't really know, but I mean, I do know that I think that in some senses that, that it's probably going to be closer to more of the second half because the things, if you look in the, the trumpet and vile judgments, they're a lot more serious. And it's like one theologian said that, that uh, some of these things are going to be so much destruction that if you had too much time period in between, you know, the earth just, I mean, it tells you that, that you know, if, God didn't intervene. Jesus said he didn't intervene. You know, no one would be able to be alive. That you can't keep having these things. I mean, like when trees and vegetation are destroyed, you have, you know, a lot of life's destroyed and all kinds of contamination, all these things going on, you know, that they sit there for years and years. So, you know, I would tend to think that the seal judgments, you know, like I said, they definitely take up a good chunk of the, of the tribulation to start. Because remember, for that first half, there's not a whole lot in one sense going on. That's when the Antichrist still has this treaty with Israel. He doesn't break it. You know, that, that, that treaty exists for that three and a half years. You know, Israel's safe in that respect. Then at the second half of the Great Tribulation, that's when he breaks it at the start of that, when he desecrates the temple. And that's when the Jewish people realize, hey, this guy, you know, he's not the real, you know, the real Christ. And so, you know, they realize that he really is the Antichrist. And that's when they turn against him. That's when they escape to... Uh, what believe either be Petra or, you know, Jordan or a place in Egypt or where. But, uh, you know, I just, 
I tend to think that, you know, like I said, so, you know, it's, it's more quiet. Well, when you got that peace and things going on, so that'd be more like the seal judgments. You know, that's, you know, we still have wars or things like that. But in this case here, you know, I'm not saying there won't be wars, but they're not necessarily, you know, wars with uh, Israel. And, you know, who knows? In theory, maybe it's, there's nothing. All you have is that first seal judgment for that whole seven, uh, three and a half years. And then that war comes about with the battle of Gog and Magog. And, you know, like some theologians say there in the second half and at the desecration and so forth. But, Anyway, so just kind of keep that in mind that they do take up a lot more of a longer time period. Now, the seven years of the tribulation are the final seven years prophesied by Daniel when he spoke of the 490 years. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. I was going to wait till next week to do this, but I guess I'll go ahead and... Get through it. it might still take a little bit. So. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Let's turn there. Remember, I said that Daniel is the 27th book in the Old Testament, and Revelation is the 27th book in the New Testament. You know, those are equivalent. Daniel is the revelation of the Old Testament, not only in its same order. Again, that shows you you've got how he inspires things. He purposely put Daniel as the 27th book to match the 27th book of the New Testament. But it also deals with the tribulation and different things like that. You know, it's at the end times, just like Revelation. You know, it's kind of like the Old Testament equivalent of it. So, you know, here again, that's why I said, you know, there's more places in the Bible than just Revelation that deal with the tribulation. So, you see that time period, you know, met, you know I mentioned about the first Thessalonians, the second Thessalonians, and so forth. You know, Jesus talked about it, Matthew, and... So look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, I've talked about this before, but a week is seven years. So 70 times seven, or 490 years. You know, it's 70 weeks. So if you have 70 weeks, and each week is seven years, then that's 490 years. You know, I've said that before, but it's kind of like, you know, we call it a 10-year period a decade, or a 100-year period a century, or 1,000 years a millennium, and so forth. The, you know, what the Jewish people call the seven-year period uh, a year. You know, that, I, mean, I mean, a week, rather. And, um, you know, that was just, you know, they knew what it was talking about. You know, they, you know, just like we know the difference between, you know, we say day versus we're talking about daylight or we're talking about day, which includes the nighttime too or whatever, just depending on the context. So, but Israel has gone through 483 years, which stopped when Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And the final seven will start up again here in the tribulation. You know, I, we saw that before, like on Palm Sunday, it tells you right literally to the day that, you know, Jesus said, you know, from the time when Cyrus had made this thing, there'd be those 483 years, and that's when he would return. And that's why the people should have known that that was Jesus coming in on Palm Sunday, because it was literally to the day that it was prophesied, that 483 years. And so, but then, when, you know, that stopped at that point. And they, they killed off, you know, they killed Jesus. So, you know, that, that, um, you know, that, that, that seven, uh, last seven years never went on. Now then it starts again once they sign that seven-year peace treaty with, with the Antichrist and, and those seven years of the tribulation. Now, that's why I said to it, that it go, you know, what's the time period of the Jews up to the death of Jesus? Then we have the church age right now, the, grace, the church, uh, age of grace. And then once the, the church gets raptured out, when the tribulation starts again, now that we go back to that period of, you know, under the law, you know, which was the, the Israel, you know, so it goes back to that during the seven years again. Then we'll go to the new uh, dispensation of the millennial reign. But here it shows you that's where you, and why it goes back there, because it has to have those seven years get fulfilled. Um but let's take a look at Daniel chapter 9, look at verses 26 and 27. 
So Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, 27. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The streets shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off and not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be what they flood, and under the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now we notice it says, uh, it shall be seven weeks, and then comma, and three score, two weeks. Well, three score, remember, score is 20, so that's 62 weeks plus seven. That's 69 weeks. So there's been 69 weeks. We have one week left. Remember, a week is seven years. So there's where it tells us that the tribulation is seven years long. You know, it doesn't tell you that anywhere in Revelation. We know that it's seven years by that, that one last week. Now, I'm not sure exactly why it separates between the seven weeks and the 62 weeks. I haven't ever really figured that out. I don't know anybody that does seem to know that, but the, um, in a way, it's still, that's so 69 weeks. Now, that 69 weeks, as I said, that ended when, on Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered in to uh, Jerusalem. Now, remember that a biblical year is 360 days and not 365 days. You know, that's significance. You know, they're, they're, remember, they're always based off the lunar calendar. You know, ours is based off the solar calendar. And, you know, all the nations were that way. That, that you know, biblically, a year is 360 days. So, you know, when we're talking about how long the tribulation is going to be, then it's seven years of 360 days, which comes out to whatever, I don't remember how many days off the top of my head what that is, but, you know, it tells us in Scripture what it is. But it, you know, if you're trying to base it off 365 days, you'd say, well, the Bible's wrong. Well, no, it's not wrong because it's based off a 360-day year. You know, the Jewish people, they still use a 360-day year. So, you know, they'll, they'll clearly understand this. But Daniel 9, chapter 27 shows, the, as I said, the length of the tribulation is seven years. You know, we just, we just read that, but um, I want to read it again. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That must be... Uh, To 28, verse 28, maybe, or something. Anyway, I must have that one wrong. Anyway, then, um, so, you know, we see that, you know, the covenant is for for one week, you know, which, as I said, that's where you get, um, oh, that one must have been 25 and 26. It should have been verses 25 and 26, I guess, or whatever. I had 26 and 27. So, the, um, You know, as I said, that's where we get the seven years from. But we see there, it says, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. You know, that's why I say, that's where he goes in and talks about he desecrates the temple, you know, in 1 Thessalonians and so forth, or 2 Thessalonians, where, where he desecrates the temple. And uh, that's when the Jewish people realize, you know, that's when he breaks that, that seven-year treaty. And that's when the Jewish people realize, okay, he's not really, you know, the Messiah. He's the false Messiah, you know, the false Christ. The Antichrist. And so that's when, you know, like I said, that's when it's believed that there's war, and that's when they run away and, and so forth. They'll run you know, Petra and, and so forth. Now, um, you know, so again, that's where we know. And then and remember in that second half, you know, where it says in the midst of the week, you know, that second half or that second week, you know, part of the week, then, then that's what's known as the Great Tribulation. Now, the four horses that we, we will look at here in Revelation are similar in color to those described by Zechariah, as we saw in that study, but seem to speak of different time periods and people. You know, we studied in Zechariah there about the four horses. And, you know, I'm not going to really get into them now, but we'll, um, we'll see. You know, here's a white horse, and we're going to see, you know, their colors, you know, they're red and black and so forth. And... But remember that these horses in, in, in Zechariah, they were not, they were not um, 
They're not the same horses, you know, just like Jesus himself, when he comes at his second coming, he rides on a white horse, but it's not the same white horse. He's not the same rider as the white horse we just saw here. This white horse is the imitation and it's the Antichrist, you know, the rider and the white horse in Revelation 19, that would be Jesus and so forth. So, you know, just keep that in mind that, you know, they're, they're, they're similar, but they're not the same. You know, again, like I said, Satan tries to copy everything God does and so forth. So, you know, don't get confused there that that they're uh, the same thing. Plus, they're talking about different, not necessarily talking about the same thing, you know, time periods and so forth, and people. So. But we'll pick it up next week in Revelation chapter 6, verse 3, and we'll continue from there. But I do want to go ahead and try to finish that up there with Daniel. And, you know, just, but just keep that in mind. And like I said, that's where we get the, the time period for the tribulation and so forth. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us to study your word. Not only in Revelation, but just a little bit here in Daniel. And that we uh, see these things here where uh, we know, as I said, that time is, is coming soon when the Antichrist will, will appear on the scene. And so, Father, we thank you that we will not be here, that uh, you always take your people out. Before, before it's too late. And so, Father, we just pray that many souls might be won before that, that we might have the boldness to go out and try to witness and win as many as we can before it's too late because that day will be here. You know, what, you know, what are they going to do to us? They can only threaten us with, with heaven. Oh, that's bad. You know, and so, you know, don't worry about trying to be afraid to die because if you die, if you're truly saved, you're just going to heaven anyway and you get out of this uh, sinful world that's just controlled by Satan. So, you know, either way, it's a win-win situation. And then if you're able to win them to, to Jesus, then you win there as well. So, so Father, we just, you know, we plus your command us, we have to go out and win this. That's what you tell us to do. And you said, those who win souls are wise. In the Proverbs there, you tell us. So, Father, we just thank you for all that you do. We ask that you bless the rest of this day. Bless our week and just allow for a safe return for the midweek service. And we just pray, Lord, that, that you... Uh, Keep us all healthy and safe. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.